Hi everybody and welcome. A few weeks back I published on my LinkedIn account a post regarding all your data augmentation and I noticed that quite a lot of people got interested in it. And I thought, well, why not make a whole series about all your data augmentation? And here we are. In this new series, you'll learn all about all your data augmentation, the theory behind it, the implementation, why it's important, and we'll do that by looking at the different audio data augmentation techniques that you can use and how you can implement them in Python from scratch and using audio data augmentation libraries. So without any further ado, let's get started. In this first video, you'll learn why audio data augmentation is important and what it is. But we'll get started from data augmentation more generally. So what's data augmentation? Well, it is a technique used to increase the number of samples a machine learning model sees during training. So what's the goal of data augmentation? Well, let's assume this is your problem space. So this two dimensional uh, space here and this blue dots are your samples. Of course, you, with your samples, you can cover only a certain amount of the whole space. So by augmenting data, so by creating other samples derived from the original samples, you are adding more points that cover more space in your problem space. So in other words, the goal of data augmentation, instead of covering the problem space as much as possible. So how does data augmentation work? Well, uh, it, it's basically a sort of like transformation pipeline that you use. Well, you start with your piece of audio. So it could be any type of data really. So of course we are dealing with audio here, but it could be images. So you have your audio, you pass it to a some sort of like transformer. In the case of images, it could be like cropping, it could be rotation. In the case of audio, it could be adding reverb or pitch shifting. Of course, we'll see all of these techniques later on during the series. And then you get out a new version, a derived version of the original audio file in this case. And so that is augmented, augmented data. Cool. Uh, of course, data augmentation is used extensively in image uh, processing. And here, like we have an example. So we have the image of a cat and then we derive a lot of images starting from this image by using a bunch of different uh, audio augmentation techniques. Like for example, uh, cropping, rotation, or it's just like shifting the cat up and down or left and, and right. Cool. Now, of course, we all know that data augmentation is a big thing in computer vision and uh, image processing, but it's not really that used in audio. And that's a shame because uh, audio data augmentation can help your algorithms quite a lot. And indeed, let's take a look why you should care about uh, audio data augmentation. First of all, Audio data augmentation address the problem of data scarcity. Of course, because you're just like creating more samples derived from the data set that you originally have. So if you have a small data set, um, using augmentation is a handy way of increasing the number of samples that you have. Then uh, data augmentation can increase your model's robustness. Of course, because you are uh, now having a data set that covers more uh, regions of your problem space. And as a good consequence of that, your uh, models are gonna be more robust. And of course, this uh, data augmentation improves models accuracy. And that's again, a sort of consequence of the fact that we cover more of the problem space. Then uh, data augmentation can also be used to reduce uh, overfitting and of course to save resources to collect and label data. And that's because you are not using resources to collect data, but rather you start from the data that you have and you just sort of like multiply them by a certain factor. So these are all the reasons why you should use audio data augmentation. This is all well and good, but remember that augmented data is not as good as additional data. And the reason why that's the case is because at the end of the day, the uh, augmented data that you can derive is 
derived from original data. So you have some sort of variants of original samples, but these are not really new samples. So if you ha had like two data sets with the same number of samples, but one was with all like sort of like original data and one was with augmented data, then of course like the one with original data would be qualitatively better in a sense because you have more variety. Whereas in the case of augmented, uh, the, the data set with augmented data, well, there you have a lot of data samples that are actually uh, derived from other samples. Okay. But let's take a look at the different use cases for audio data augmentation. What are these? Well, there are a bunch of uh, use cases. So here I'm gonna just like um, share three of them through certain papers and a, th a thesis that I think like are really interesting and you should definitely like check out. So the first one, so uh, this is a sort of like seminal paper that introduced in a sense like the use of data augmentation within uh, the audio space. So the, the paper is called Exploring Data Augmentation for Improved Singing Voice Detection with Neural uh, Networks. So this one is really cool and it just like shows that if you use uh, audio data augmentation you can uh, improve your algorithms for singing uh, voice uh, detection. Then Another use case here. So this paper is data is called data augmentation improves recognition of foreign accented speech. In this case, of course, we are using data augmentation for improving another use case uh, that in this case is in the, in the speech processing field. And then here there's a master's uh, thesis, which I think like was really, really cool. And I read it and I highly suggest you to go like check that out. And the, the, the thesis is all about using audio data augmentation for music instrument uh, recognition. And the author here shows that uh, audio data augmentation can help improve accuracy with regard to music instrument recognition. So as you see, then audio data augmentation can be used for a bunch of different use cases in different sort of like subdomains of audio music processing. So you can uh, be fruitful, fruitfully used for like music data, for speech data, as well as for environmental sound. In other words, whenever you have some audio data, do remember to use audio augmentation. It will help you no matter the type of use case you are um, addressing. Okay, so now I want to share a sort of like pro tip here. So when you uh, augment your data, so you just, you probably don't want just like to use one single type of uh, transformation, but rather what you can do is pass your sample through a chain of transformations. So you can uh, pass your uh, this like audio file, for example, to the first transformation and then uh, pass it to a second transformation, a third and so on and so forth until like you get your augmented piece of data. Now, uh, the cool thing about this is that you can randomly select transformations to apply. So you have, you could have like a pool of different transformations and you could randomly decide whether like to use certain transformations or not. And then you can uh, randomly select transformation parameters. So say for example, for pitch shifting, you can say that you want to shift up or down up to two turns up or two turns down uh, your uh, your audio file. So, uh, and this can be done randomly so that you ensure that you're gonna have some sort of like randomization in the way you create uh, your augmented data. Cool. Now, there's a sort of rookie mistake that I see done time and again, which is augmenting the validation set or the test set. Don't do that. What data should you augment? Well, you should only augment the train set. The risk is that if you augment the validation and the test set, you may have some sort of like a data leakage. So how do you ensure that you do augmentation the right way? Well, first of all, you should split your data set into your different sets, so train, validation, and test set. And then only at that point, you do apply uh, data augmentation only to the train set. Cool. So 
Another question that you may have is when should I augment data? So here there are a couple of options that you have. One is called offline augmentation and the other one, you guess it, it will be online augmentation. So let's take a look at offline augmentation. So here, uh, this is like quite basic. So the idea is that you are pre-computing uh, the augmented data before training. So in other words, you have your sort of like data augmentation pipeline and you pass all of your data that you want to augment your train set and then you get the augmented data out of that. And that's it. It's done like with its own code and it's done offline. You just like pre-compute this before doing any sort of a training. So what's the good about like this approach? Well, uh, the good is, is that it saves computations in the long run because you just like do the, the computation once and then you can just store uh, all the augmented data and you can just like retrieve them when you want to actually train your data set. And then uh, another sort of like advantage of this approach is that the, augmented, the augmentation code is separate from the model code. So you are respecting separation of concerns, which is always like a good thing. But there are a couple of disadvantages with offline augmentation. So the first one is that the uh, augmentation most of the time is done on CPU. So that's slower because you're not leveraging GPU acceleration. And then you need more storage to uh, yeah, store the augmented data because of course you do the transformation and then you do store the data that you'll retrieve at training time. Okay. So the other approach that you have is online augmentation. So let's take a look at this. So in this case, you apply transformations during uh, training time. And this is carried out with sort of like libraries that are integrated somewhat with deep learning libraries. For example, an example of this will be Torch Audio Transforms. And we'll, we'll take a look like at this library like later on in the series, but yeah, just to name that. So the basic idea here is that you do these transformations like in real time, basically, while you are training your models. Now, the good thing about this approach is that generally uh, these um, transformations can be done on GPU, so they are going to be faster. And also the model deployment is going to be easier because this, uh, the part of data augmentation is sort of like bundled within the uh, the model itself to a certain extent, right? Then uh, you also have a couple of disadvantages here. So uh, the augmentation module is coupled with the model code and this is not really great, again, because you want to separate concerns and you want for the augmentation code to be like it's in its own module or modules and the, the, the model code in its own modules as well. They should be separate. Then the other disadvantage that you have here is that uh, online augmentation is computational expensive in the long run because every time you want to train your models, you're going to rerun data augmentation and that will take time. So because you're not storing that information, but you're just like transforming the data and then passing it to your uh, deep learning or machine learning algorithm. Cool. One final thing that I think it's extremely important that you understand is that the augmented audio that you generate must be credible. What do I mean by this? Well, you want for your augmented data to be credible. So if you have too much distortion of your audio or uh, you have, for example, say, yeah, Typical case. So you have a violin sound, right? So, and then you want just like to pitch shift that and you pitch shift your violin uh, melody two octaves below. Well, that is going to be problematic because like the violin doesn't go down to that low register, right? So the sound is no longer credible because a violin wouldn't like sound like that. Right, because it doesn't have the sort of like a range to in the bass section of the frequency, right? So, and it's not just about like speed shifting, it could be anything. So as a general rule, whenever like you add too much of a transformation, so uh, you're gonna create some sort of like distortion, things that are not credible. What you want to do is avoiding that and keeping all of your sample, uh, augmented samples as credible as possible. 
So think of this as the golden rule of augmentation. This not only applies to audio, but also to any other type of data that you may be dealing with. Cool. So that's it for this first video where I just gave you an initial introduction to audio data augmentation, what it is, why it's important and different aspects like the golden rule. Now, if you want to learn more about this and you want to, you have like questions or things like that, of course you can leave them in the comment section below as always, but I do suggest you to join the Sound of AI Slack community. So there, at the moment of this video, we are more than 4,000 people interested in all things AI, audio music, and it's a very cool community, super supportive. You have the link to sign up in the description box below. What's coming up next? Well, we'll take a look at different types of audio augmentation techniques. So some will be in the waveform uh, domain or raw audio domain, some will be in the spectrogram domain. So stay tuned. If you like this video, please do leave a like and share it with your friends and colleagues. And I'll see you next time. Take care.